Reparations, a sensitive issue on both sides of the debate and long considered untouchable in U.S. politics, has come blazing back into national conversation thanks to a fiery essay and recent events in Ferguson, Missouri. Where do we go from here? That's today on The Global African. I'm Bill Fletcher, your host. Thanks for joining us. The reparations debate has returned uh, in large part because of the contribution of Ta-Nehisi Coates, whose essay in The Atlantic has shaken many people, reawakened interest in, in a debate that periodically surfaces like a seasonal flower. Reparations is about repair and repairing damage. It's a, it's a debate that takes place not just in connection with the African experience in the Western Hemisphere, but internationally. Whether one is talking about repairing the damage that was the result of the Japanese invasion of China and Korea, and the enslavement of Japanese women by Imperial Japan, or whether it's about the experience of the African in the Western Hemisphere, reparations is about repairing the damage, but it can only take place in the context of discussing history. That is, there must be a willingness of a country and its total population to come to terms with their own history. And this is the problem that we in the United States face, that we would rather avoid discussing the past unless we want to discuss a myth. We rather avoid looking at problems, errors, horrors, atrocities. We'd rather focus on what we would like to believe that the past was. But when you engage in myth-making and in the beliefs in myths, you can't repair the damage that was actually done. And we're joined in the studio with Professor N.D.B. Connolly. Professor Connolly is an assistant professor of history and a co-director of the Racism, Immigration, and Citizenship Program at the Johns Hopkins University. He's the author of A World More Concrete, Real Estate and the Remaking of Jim Crow South Florida, published by the University of Chicago Press. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Bill. So let's jump right in. The Coates article on reparations that was in the Atlantic, your response. I had been a follower of uh, some of Coates' writings for about three or four years before this piece came out. One of um, my favorite pieces was Fear of a Black President. He'd done some other work on Bill Cosby and kind of class dynamics. And so there was a lot of publicity for the reparations piece just before it came out in March of this year. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, anticipating it as were many people. And so I kind of sat down and grabbed a copy and just, you know, read the whole thing in hard copy from beginning to end. And when I first read it, my initial reaction, to be honest, was a little bit of envy because I think he's got a lot of talent as a writer. But even more to the point, he's got a way of bringing a really complicated and difficult history to the public in a way that many historians simply kind of dream of, of having that kind of audience. Now, in terms of the initial point about you know, Israel and reparations to Israel, it was less a concern for me about the actual dynamics of the specific Israeli case than it was about believing in a kind of nation building project or that you could somehow separate a subsidized nation building project from a racial project. In, in terms of my own research and the work of a, a lot of other historians, it's become very clear that when you're trying to build a country and you have to determine who are citizens and who aren't, how you go about allocating resources, oftentimes racism continues to get perpetuated through those mechanisms and through the playing of certain kind of um, preferential treatments or even trying to figure out among you know, minority groups, which elites are going to dictate who gets what. And it tends to create some tensions between poorer and wealthier minorities. Many, just to be clear, there, there are many people involved in the reparations movement, mm -hmm. but not entirely, uh, that do look at reparations as a means of laying the foundation for the creation of an African-American nation. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're criticizing? In part, in part, I think the um, discussion of creating a nation within a nation, for example, Republic of New Africa in the late 1960s Correct. was, you know, very much committed to this idea. And I think we have to really, you know, think through, one, what nation building requires. 
how we're willing to support the monopoly, the state monopoly on violence, which seems to be necessary for nation building projects, how you talk about generating wealth and using, you know, capitalism to create niche markets that can become, you know, very exploitative. Oftentimes black on black predation occurs under these environments of, you know, kind of isolated, um, you know, national communities that, where people don't have options. And I'm certainly, you know, can talk more about that specifically. But I think there's, there's a real need to think about class dynamics under capitalism within black communities before we start talking about building nations. But even, let, let's, let's open it up uh, a little broader because mm -hmm. not everyone that uh, supports reparations supports an independent black republic right. or something like that. Right. But the basic notion of reparations is repairing the damage. Mm -hmm. and, one, and so there's those that look at the damage as being the period of slavery. Mm -hmm. There are those that look at the damage as sort of a continuing violation mm -hmm. of our rights. Mm -hmm. um, so how is the notion of reparations as an expression of an effort to repair the damage, how is that inconsistent with uh, challenges to capitalism itself as a system? So when you're thinking about reparations for slavery, I'm, I hold what may be a minority view that it's gonna be impossible to quantify the loss of lives, the loss, loss of man hours, broken up families, sexual mm -hmm. violations, all of the things that went into slavery as an institution. It, mm -hmm. it literally is priceless. You cannot put a number on that. And the way in which the country, especially in the 20th century, generated its you know, wealth and really became a superpower had as much to do with segregation and Jim Crow as it had to do with the previous wealth accumulations that were done under slavery. So from where I sit, simply putting slavery in a jar and saying, okay, we're gonna look at black loss of life, black hardship from 1619 to 1865, or even bring it up through the reconstruction period and thinking about just the difficulties sure. there. That's not gonna actually solve our problem because the, deep, the deeper problem are those continuities that came out of slavery, the difficulties that blacks had of holding on to land once they in fact acquired it. If it's not inconsistent with uh, the larger question of capitalism, mm -hmm. then, then what's your critique? Then I'm trying. Maybe that goes into the second part of your critique of, of the of the essay. Yeah. So in terms of the argument put forward, um, a lot of what uh, Coates describes as being a starting point comes out of John Conyers's House Resolution 40 which asks for an allocation of $8 million to just begin talking about right. and studying the legacies of slavery. Mm -hmm. And you know, there are a couple of, of reasons why um, the bill hasn't been you know, brought through. Obviously, there's one issue that revol resolves, around, you know, revolves around the fact that getting through anything through Congress is gonna be difficult, especially you know, one dominated by you know, right-wing uh, Republicans in many right. respects. Um, but there's also another issue that gets raised about you know, the political will among African Americans to really push this, push this issue. Because $8 million, as you know, is a drop in the bucket in mm -hmm. terms of the kinds of resources that African Americans have at their disposal. Mm -hmm. I mean, LeBron James and Jay-Z and Beyonce could pull their resources and come up with $8 million tomorrow if they wanted to. That's right. Right? Absolutely. Um, so the issue is not necessarily the $8 million and getting that allocated. The issue is, are we actually willing to open up a conversation about a word that most people don't want to use, which is white supremacy, right? Particularly among black elites who have gone through a lot of trouble to work their way into positions of power and have some kind of stake in making sure that um, peace and prosperity kind of continue without too much trouble along kind of historical lines. Um, so on, on the one hand, I think you know, pushing for a House resolution is not going to be the way to go just because of the nature of Congress and by, by virtue of that you know, resource being spent, what we would have is more research on capitalism and slavery and exploitation. And we already kind of have a pretty robust historical literature on this. Like we mm -hmm. know a lot about you know, how slavery you know, worked, how slavery and capitalism worked together. Mm -hmm. We know a lot about how people made money off of segregation in the 20th century. So as far as beginning a process of healing or repair, there's enough on the, on the books already to get that ball rolling. And so I, have a, I take a little bit of, of, of issue with that. Um, the other thing is that, you know, in terms of what I mentioned earlier, like restructuring society, there are a couple of very concrete things that I think we can do. You know, 
um, again, that don't necessarily get addressed in, in Coach's piece, but I think obviously he's thinking about these things. One is having a 15th Amendment that has some real teeth in it, that makes voting rights a positive right, not simply a right that the states so-called can't take away, right? Because in this country, you're not actually guaranteed voting by the Constitution. I think that needs to change. I think there needs to be a way that we guarantee that even if you're convicted of a felony, felony you don't lose the franchise. That would mm -hmm. fundamentally change from the outset the relationship between black communities and the political process in the age of mass incarceration. Right? That's the first thing. The second thing I think we can do is deal with the jurisprudence that came after the civil rights movement that's made it very difficult to get civil rights legislation through or make other kinds of breakthroughs for racial inequality. And what I'm speaking about specifically is a legal standard that since the mid-1970s has been known as discriminatory intent. So disparate impact is a legal standard where you could just present, present evidence to the court Precisely. and say, 80% of African Americans suffer disproportionately under, you know, public housing allotments or because right. of employment restrictions. Now you have to actually prove that on the basis of race, somebody meant to deny you those goods and services, That's right. which is almost an impossible legal standard Precisely. to meet, right? right? So we have to address that. And, and I think there's a way that, you know, very smart attorneys can think about bundling together case law the way they bundled it together in the age of Plessy and really work, you know, sometimes over several decades, actually get the standard of discriminatory intent on the table for discussion and challenge, not simply the case like you know, stand your ground or the like. The biggest problem is what I perceive to be the problem of white popular sovereignty, which is a political cultural problem wherein by all accounts, the American people as a group are understood to be white Americans, right? The black populations and the brown populations of this country, you know, have never really been considered part of the mass electorate, even under a black president. And the example that I point to in the article that I write in response to codes is, you know, Barack Obama's response to the birther movement, right? Where he's basically getting a very small but vocal group of white Americans who demand to see his birth certificate on the basis of, you know, unfounded suspicions. Right. And the president has to actually use government resources to send his representative to Hawaii and furnish this long, you know, form birth certificate to an unnamed population, like right. based on what? The other example of this comes in the case of Cliven Bundy in Nevada, right? The, you may remember the oh, white yeah. rancher who basically yeah. decided he wasn't going to pay taxes on government land he was using to graze his cattle, right? The Bureau of Land Management goes out there and tries to make him, you know, furnish those taxes, and a white militia basically makes the government flee from the, the scene of the conflict. Um, again, that's an act that you know and I know would never happen in an inner city black community or, or Latino community where folks would take up arms and to put up a, a, a kind of stand against the government, right? But that happens mm -hmm. in places where whites are allowed to basically take arms and control. So I, I would suggest that there's a, a bigger kind of political culture that needs to be addressed and that you, even beyond simply having conversations about it, you can actually change rules and change laws that would make that a far less sustainable American tradition. Professor, we're going to have to have you back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to come back. That's Excellent. fine. Excellent. Thank you so much, Professor Conley. Thank you. It's wonderful. Okay. Cool. Thank you very much. And we're joined by Professor Ajwa Ayatoro, who is the, a founding member of the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America. She was a founding chair and currently chairs its Legal Strategies Committee. She's a law professor at the University of Arkansas William H. Bowman School on Law, and the director of the Racial Disparities in the Arkansas Criminal Justice System Research Project. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. So we're going to start with a question about the uh, very popular article in The Atlantic by Ta Nahisi Coates regarding reparations. And I was curious what your feelings were about both the article, its analysis, but also the response that it's received. You, you asked me about the response to it. Well, Correct. The response that I heard and saw was, in fact, a response uh, that uh, from the reparations community was very embracing, again, very much saying yes. You know, uh, the response also to me uh, keeps that discussion alive because I think we've had a lull in the discussion on reparations uh, and I think it keeps it it, it, it makes it a national focus uh, because of, of the uh, person who was writing the article had a national forum uh, and so I think the response to it uh, that I heard that was positive is good from the reparations community and others too I don't think they would uh, that that was the only positive response. And I always feel any negative response, and I didn't see a lot of negative response, but I didn't research and 
in that in terms of response. But my view has always been with reparations since we first started the, uh, the in COBRA first started back in the late 80s, uh, is that any response is a good response because it keeps the discussion out there and allows us to have uh, the debate, but also allows us to move forward in um, our goal of one day obtaining reparations. Let's, let's pick up on, uh, or take off from that. The, one of the things that I was looking forward to in speaking with you is that you're not only a theorist when it comes to reparations, but you're a movement builder. And, yeah. and I'm interested in your sense as to what have been some of the challenges in actually moving the reparations discussion, uh, including within black America, but not just exclusively black America. The biggest challenges, I think, uh, are uh, one, that some, that some people put it forward as a reparations for slavery. And one of the things that my friend, mentor, and, and colleague uh, Ron Walter said to me a number of years ago when we were forming repar uh, the reparations uh, in COBRA, I'm sorry, is that we have to make people understand that it's not about some historical fact. It's about current day injury that, that people are having that is linked directly to the enslavement and Jim Crow, period. What will it take then to turn it into a mass movement? I think it takes the, um, more of us who are in movement building, and I count you as one, Bill, uh, to really push the issue back into our organizations that we are members of and leaders of. Let me ask you one more question, which is, how do you handle the argument? And it's an argument that we often hear also in con context of affirmative action, that uh, reparations for African Americans as a whole uh, is problematic, that it should be something that's somehow targeted on the basis of class or poverty within black America? Well, I answer that question, and I've consistently answered that question, because it's not, a, it, as you know, it's not a new question. Mm -hmm. It's a question, it's a point that was raised even as we formed in COBRA in the late 80s and into the 90s. Uh, by so some people that call themselves allies to reparations, but want to pare it down to those that they view in quotes are the most deserving, which are poor right. black people. Well, it wasn't just poor black people that they enslaved. It wasn't just poor black people that suffered from Jim Crow. It's not just poor black people who continue with the vestiges of slavery. We still have a problem, you know, uh, uh, with black people at all levels being treated in a, a racist way that's linked to our enslavement. The second thing I think it does is it marginalizes our communities and it makes our communities fight within themselves. And it, 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 it's like, you know, Oprah Winfrey said some years ago, well, I don't want reparations. I don't need it. Well, if you don't need it, sign it over to a charity, you know? So Indeed. my view is that reparations are owed to African descendants in the United States. I also think that it's, it's it, it, if in fact your concern is the poorest of the poor, and then you need to do some additional things addressing class, but that's not reparations for the, the crime of slavery and Jim Crow. That's something else. That becomes a class issue that we need to deal with. Got it. Well, thank you very much, Professor Adwa Ayatoro, uh, for spending this time with us and, and talking with us about this and I'd like to pursue some of these issues of strategy and the reparations movement on another episode. But thank you very much for your time. And thank you for joining us for this segment of The Global African. I'm your host, Bill Fletcher. We'll be back in a moment. It's a pleasure and an honor to be joined uh, today by Professor Charles Ogletree, the Jesse Clemenko Professor of Law of Harvard Law School and the founding and executive director of the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice at the Harvard Law School. Professor Ogletree, welcome to the program. I'm pleased to be on the program today. I wanted to start with a discussion of the uh, Coates article on reparations from the Atlantic and just your thoughts about the content of the article as well as the reception that it's received. 
Well, let me say a word about the article. I, I'm glad the coach wrote it because it has a lot to do with uh, talking about reparations. Uh, but I've heard uh, from people who read Atlantic all the time that this is the most popular uh, article ever written in the magazine. Uh, and people, black, white, male, female, left, right, whatever their political affiliation may be, read this article uh, and got something from it, even if they disagree with some of their findings, and said a little bit about uh, the author. Uh, what was made, made it so significant is that this is the year 2014, and the whole idea that the reparations movement, which we talked about decades ago, uh, still has uh, not only some vitality, uh, but has a lot of people trying to figure out where it's going to go. And the final thing I want to say uh, is that uh, there have already been, uh, in 2014, some uh, granting of reparations. Uh, the role that the German, Germans have played with some societies, the role that uh, people around the diaspora uh, have been able to get some reparations. Uh, and I can tell you right now, having traveled from Los Angeles uh, to Boston, from the West Coast all the way through the East Coast, People are still asking me every single week, you know, what's happening with the reparations movement? It's alive, uh, it's well. We're trying to make sure that uh, this government, like other governments, are responding to the need to give people uh, something that they deserve. It seems clear that there's a sentiment, at least an interest in, in uh, within uh, black America on reparations, but it's not clear to me that there's a movement. Would you disagree? There is a movement. I'm going to Los Angeles in October, and I've already been contacted by people about that. I've been contacted by individuals who carry these signs about reparations for people of African descent, uh, who are doing it not just when there's a demonstration, not just when there's a rally, but every single day. Uh, and people are asking for more information. Uh, and so it, it is clear. And you have to remember that when we started this effort, uh, the, many of the people uh, have, in a sense, uh, some of them have passed away, uh, and some of them have uh, no longer been involved with all in it. So it's a whole new generation, and they want to sit, learn about reparations. Uh, and what makes it even more significant is not just African Americans, but it's also whites who have been very active in talking about what we need to do, uh, how do we pay, how do we whites who are benefited from it when we were responsible for the ships uh, going to Africa, responsible for the goods that came at uh, different places, responsible for the statues that are built, uh, and we have to make, make sure it happens. We had these discussions, uh, and I revived them, as you know, in 19, with the 1921 Tulsa race riot survivors, African-American women and men in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, who were asking for modern reparations. What happens to us when they destroyed what we call the Black Wall Street? Mm -hmm. Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, the whole idea was, can we do it? And most of those, over 90%, well over 90% of the people that I met in 2003 uh, have passed away uh, in the last decade or more. Uh, and uh, I remember they were just children in 1921 when we had the sense of the Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Blacks had businesses, they had barber shops, they had stores, they were very successful. And they said, we don't mind being separate uh, because uh, we can still succeed in what we're going to be able to do. And meeting those people and going down to Tulsa, Oklahoma uh, and talking to them uh, and finding out that they were the children uh, of uh, reparationists, people who moved for reparations in the early 20th century in 1920 and 1921. And that was very important. Professor Charles Ogletree of Harvard Law School, thank you so much for taking this time to spend with us to discuss this issue. My pleasure. And I hope that people understand that reparations now, reparations tomorrow, reparations forever, we have to make sure that it happens. And because of the work of people like yourself, they will. The beauty of the discussion now is that it permits us to open up an examination of race in the United States. It, it allows us the opportunity to open up a discussion about the history of the African experience in the United States and for that matter in the Western Hemisphere. And indeed, what it provides is an opportunity should we choose to accept it, to repair the damage that was done to this project 
known as the United States of America. And in repairing that damage, to actually enter into the body of countries in the civilized world. Those are my thoughts for this episode of The Global African. I'm your host, Bill Fletcher. Thank you.